Hello, and welcome to Fact and Fiction, Intelligence and National Security Careers, Mental Health, and Clearances. Please welcome INSA President Suzanne Wilson-Heckenberg. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for Fact and Fiction. I'm really looking forward to today's discussion. It's an important one for the intelligence and national security community and those currently pursuing careers, as well as those looking to develop their future in the IC. This program today is underwritten by GDIT, who seeks to shine a light on an important issue facing many in the cleared workforce. But before we begin today's program, a couple of housekeeping notes. If you have questions, and we hope you do, please submit them through the question box on the right side of your screen. We will not share any names or organizations, so don't be shy about asking what is on your mind. We are pleased to welcome members of the press to the call today, and a reminder that the program will be available on our website early next week. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Amy Gilliland. Amy is the president of General Dynamics Information Technology. GDIT is the technology and IT services business unit within the General Dynamics Corporation with over 28,000 employees and 8.5 billion in revenue. GDIT serves customers in the intelligence community, DOD and federal and civilian markets, offering a broad portfolio of capabilities in areas such as cybersecurity, AI, analytics, and high performance computing. Amy proudly graduated from the Naval Academy and served in the Navy, Navy prior to her nearly two decades of leadership positions at General Dynamics. She has been outspoken over the years about the importance of leading with compassion and is an advocate for destigmatizing mental care and self care. I can't think of a better leader today to lead us through today's vital conversation and quite honestly, what I think is a long overdue conversation. Amy, the stage is yours and thank you again. Thank you so much, Suzanne. It's great to be here and I agree with you. This is such an important conversation. The cleared community works in a high stress environment in the best of times and it's been especially challenging for employees working in this environment throughout the pandemic. You know, the facts show that we are experiencing really a global mental health crisis. Um, and as people navigate and come out of the pandemic, they're also dealing with other stresses like societal tensions and um, economic strains uh, as the, the economy is, is going through and in inflation and other uh, sorts of pressures. One fifth of the US population has been diagnosed with mental health illness and three quarters of US workers are experiencing symptoms of a mental health condition right now. That's what the facts say. And so certainly the intelligence community has not uh, been spared in these, in these facts. And for GDIT in particular, employee suicide has been um, in part a catalyst for having real conversations over the course of the last year, year and a half about how employees are doing. In fact, we started a campaign called How Are You Really? Uh, to encourage employees to check in on each other and see how they're doing during these difficult times. I've made a personal commitment to have conversations about mental health across the company as a result of this campaign. And that's really what brought the idea for today, because as I've talked to employees, it became evident in interactions that there is a real stigma around mental health. So I wanna thank INSA for providing a platform to have this important conversation. And I am very fortunate today to be joined by an esteemed panel so if we can pull them up here. One more coming. Mark, I don't know if you've accepted your, there we go. Okay, great, 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 great. So uh, first, uh, I'd like to introduce Mark Fraunfelter. He's the Assistant Director of the Special Security Directorate at the National Counterintelligence and Security Center, also known as NCSC. Mariano 
Martineau, who is the Assistant Director for Adjudications at DCSA. Dr. Michael Priester, who is a Chief Psychologist, Adjudications at DCSA. And Colonel Ken McCready, U.S. Army retired, who is the Director of the Fort Meade Alliance Board of Directors and Chair of its Military and Family Committee. So thank you all so much for being here today. Really appreciate it and looking forward to our conversation. You are clearly the right people to help us answer some very popular um, questions on, on this topic. So really looking forward to your insights. But I thought to get us all going, it might be helpful to align around some commonly asked questions about clearances and mental health. So Aaron, if you could launch the first poll question, that would be great. All right, what percent of clearance denials and revocations are because of psychological issues alone? Higher than 20%, between 3% and 8%, or less than 1%? We're gonna give everybody a minute or two here. We got hundreds on the phone today, so wanna see what the, uh, the outcome of the poll is here. Let's give it another five seconds or so. I know I have uh, been asked this question a lot personally, so I am, I'm glad to see us getting an answer here as we wade into the discussion today. All right, Aaron, can you bring up the poll result? All right, it looks like uh, it was pretty close between three and 8% and less than 1%. So I am gonna turn it over to Mariana and Dr. Priester, who I think might be able to give us some insight on what the correct answer is. Yes, uh, thank you, Amy. So Mariana Martino here. Um, we actually have some information on our website, so I was really happy to see the answer is really close to accurate in the poll, which is less than 1%. So uh, Dr. Priester, who you also have on the panel, has done an extensive amount of research on our adjudicative patterns over the last nearly 10 years at this point. And, and we've looked at every single denial or replication that uh, the DOD CAF, well, formerly known as the DOD CAF, now DCSA, uh, has completed where guideline I, or psychological considerations, was the reason why a clearance was denied or revoked and it is less than 1%. So if we can show the upside down pyramid uh, chart, that would be great uh, because I think it is really, it is a single visual point to me that really drives home the fact that psychological considerations or mental health does, is not leading to people losing security clearances at the rate that it is perceived to be. So herein lies the stigma. So as you can see here, from 2012 to 2020, uh, the DOD CAF and now DCSA adjudicated 5.4 million cases, right? That's a lot of security clearances that have run through our system. There were 96, so almost 97,000 of those cases had some guideline I or psychological issues, but only 62 of those 97,000 of, which was part of that 5.4 million, actually ended up losing their security clearances for denial or revocation, or denial or revocation because of guideline I concerns. So you can see those numbers on the right hand side here. That is 0. 0.00115%. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that as an actual number, but it's small. Um, and I think this is the thing that I, if you take nothing else away from this conversation and this webinar today, is that. Having mental health concerns is not a reason uh, for you to lose your security clearance by itself. It is extraordinarily rare for that to happen. So this is the, our, our big destigmatization effort, and the reason why we dug through all of these cases uh, is to understand what, where is the actual performance of the security clearance apparatus heading. And it's, like I said, really, really small. Anna, that is such a powerful chart. So um, thank you. Sometimes the picture is worth a thousand words. Um, and uh, I think that helps certainly align us. We do have a second poll question. Aaron, if you could pull that up, I think it's equally interesting. 
some psychological conditions will automatically result in clearance, denial, or revocation. True or false? Give you a few seconds here to put your thought in. All right, Aaron, with only two choices, I think we're ready. Can you uh, launch the results there? All right, Mariana and Want to uh, you or Dr. Priester want to educate us? Sure, uh, Michael Priester here. So it is a very common belief that there are some psychological conditions that will automatically result in somebody losing or failing to gain clearance eligibility. But in fact, the correct answer is false. There are none, and indeed, across the national security community and the IC, I can assure you that there are individuals with a variety of different conditions as documented in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, that they're able, to man, uh, they're able to mitigate the concerns, usually through either remission of symptoms or through compliance with treatment. So uh, by no means are there any automatically disqualifying symptoms out there or uh, conditions out there wrong. That's really, really helpful. And I think for, for me, maybe we'll move into the question um, and answer section now, but what I heard both of you say just now um, is the word stigma. And I think, I think stigma is a really great place for us to start the conversation today. So Mark, maybe I'll start with you. Why, why do you think, or at least this has been my experience, um, that there seems to be, there's a stigma around mental health just in general um, in, in society, but why is there even more of a stigma around mental health in the in the intelligence community do you have any thoughts you could share with us on that sure amy i think um that's a very good question i think it stems from the overall atmosphere of going through the process of obtaining a security clearance and and becoming um uh occupying a position of trust so um there is a risk managed determination made and and people in the intelligence community are going through polygraphs they're going through the investigations and then there's an adjudicative process. And I think there's a lot of ambiguity about how that final decision is rendered. And really, it comes down to a risk management decision. Um, and I think, unfortunately, a lot of people make false assumptions and believe that um, um, seeking treatment or counseling for mental health-related circumstances could negatively impact um, that trust determination. So obviously we in NCSC and throughout the DNI and throughout the intelligence community are trying to tackle that issue. And as you indicated, we want to ease that stigma yeah. and assure people of all the data that, that you just showed. But, but you make a very good point. I, and I think panels like this are very important to message that, but you make a very good point. I, you know, the stigma around mental health is prevalent within the IC, but I would argue that this is associated um, throughout the workforce, throughout our nation right now. And um, it's, you know, you threw out the statistics earlier. Um, we have one in four adult Amer Americans suffering from some sort of mental health condition. But also there was a recent uh, American Psychiatric Association report that said that 50% of all workers are concerned with discussing uh, mental health issues in the workforce. Uh, so like all Americans, the intelligence community employees they deal with the same stressors that everyone is dealing with right now. You know, we have financial strains, um, uh, we have work problems, family issues, and and obviously that will result in depression, anxiety. Um, some turn to substances to to help um, alleviate some of those uh, illness or, or conditions. So it's important that we dispel this myth about seeking support and seeking treatment. Um, and how it could possibly negatively impact your clearance. We want to get away from that. And obviously, um, seeking treatment is not a reason to deny or revoke a clearance, as, as you just saw. Um, so we're strongly encouraging individuals to seek mental health where needed. Um, I think it's a much larger process than just the security piece. I think we need to approach this in a comprehensive, holistic uh, type of approach, and we're doing that now, and we all have a collective responsibility to do that. But the good news is, I think we're in a very unique place um, to actually address this. You know, one one good thing about the pandemic is 
that it opened our eyes to the importance of the mental health and well-being of the workforce. For example, in the intelligence community, we're, we're seeking um, telework opportunities. We're looking at maximizing uh, flexible work work mm. schedules and that sort of also giving excused absences for dependent care. So these things are being looked at and, and administered. So that is a good thing. But you know, speaking to the DNI, this is very important to her. Um, it's high on her list to address, and we're addressing it. And I think a lot of partnerships uh, with industry, um, with other, with DOD and the IC, and, and just a lot of partnerships. We have a very passionate and strong um, uh, partnership moving forward. That's really encouraging to hear that the IC is looking to help employees maintain their clearances instead of the opposite, which might be the you know the perception. And we all know that in this area, clearances are so important to employees. Um, so I'm also really encouraged to hear the flexibility discussion. We're certainly having that discussion inside of GDIT right now, but sometimes when people are in that moment, whatever that moment is, they may just need a day at home or maybe they need a couple of days off or just that flexibility to go deal with that issue. So really encouraged to hear um, that that is a priority um, for, for, for the community. You know, maybe I'll just pull that string a little bit more um, and Ken, you know, given your military background and also what you are doing um, right now, um, I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts um, from the military's perspective. So to what degree do you think that the current security investigation procedures and processes discourage or, or not uh, military personnel, particularly those that might need post-combat assistance um, from pursuing mental health treatment that they might need? Right, well, I'm a, I'm a retired uh, Army Colonel, uh, career intelligence officer, um, but I have a little broader perspective too because I commanded Fort Meade from 2005 to 2008. Um, and, and I think it goes beyond security clearance. Intel people have that special uh, concern in the back of their mind that um, issues they're dealing with um, may impact on their clearance in the same way as, as the civilian community does, as, as was just discussed. Uh, but it goes beyond that and with military personnel because of the ethos uh, that has traditionally been there with, with, with the military, that we're self-reliant, that you know, we can take on anything and, uh, um, you know, we can attack any hill, we can take it, um, and then we get up and, and do it again. Um, the military is widely realized um, that they have to message and react in different ways um, to destigmatize people seeking assistance. Um, and I think that's widely happening. The challenge is people still perceive the stigma. Um, yeah. We can continue to, to message all we want, but until people internalize that the stigma is not there, um, we're, we're still working on it. One of the things that, that the, the Army is doing, uh, which I know best, I'm sure the Navy, Air Force, other services are doing things also, is, is looking at this idea of resilience, uh, the ability to carry on um, the mission while dealing with all sorts of, of issues that, that are part of everyday life, but also part of the special stressors that came come with service. Um, there's five pillars of, of resilience, and I, I think I have a link that uh, takes you to a site to kind of look at those in more detail. And that's the family, uh, emotional, physical, spiritual, and social pillars that underlie uh, our individual resiliency, uh, the ability to get up in the morning and go at it again every day uh, and day in and day out uh, and, and cope with what's, what's thrown at us. Uh, one of my uh, successors as post commander uh, publicly came out and talked about his PTSD and, and talked about resilience, uh, Colonel Ed Rothstein. And he talked about resiliency as the ability to course correct when challenges occur. It's the capacity to make hard decision, to go out and find resources that you need, especially in adverse conditions. 
Um, so that's the, the context um, that the Fort Meade Alliance is, is appro approached uh, this whole question of you know, how can we build the resiliency resources on Fort Meade to enable the soldier, sailor, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, and civilians on the, on the installation uh, to accomplish their missions, whether it's the U.S. Army Field Band or U.S. Cyber mm -hmm. Command. And I'll be happy to talk later on in the talk about some of the specific things we're doing, but I think that sets the right. stage. Yeah, no, that's really, really helpful. And I'm glad that you provided the perspective um, of the of the command that you had at Fort Meade because you really have a dynamic um, set of, uh, of employees that work across the base there. And I think your point about how the Army is, uh, first, if you have leaders coming out and talking about their own challenges, um, that is always helpful and it gives uh, people of permission to be able to talk about theirs if they can see their leaders doing it. So that's a, that is um, good progress. And also your point about how the Army has programs and, and they know that it matters how they talk to soldiers about uh, mental health that that has it it, it does help um, and we may have to say it again and again and again um, but it does help and so along that line i just want to pull that thread um mariana and um, dr priester i know that uh dcsa has a mental health destigmatization campaign um and what can you tell us about the campaign its purpose, what sort of success you've had in it so far, um, and you know what's plan, what plans are for for the future because campaigns around a topic like this have to uh, move on in perpetuity. Yeah, Amy, thank you. So I'll get it started and then uh, pass the baton over to Dr. Priester uh, because he's he's largely been the the driving force and of getting all of our data together and all of our communication products. But as you were rewind just before the pandemic, there was a crisis of suicides in the Department of Defense. Um, there were, you know, it was getting a lot of attention. It was a travesty of loss for the department, for the military services, for our civilian community, for their friends and family. And, you know, one of the things that kept coming up is, is part of the narrative as we started peeling the onion back of the, inside the department was I couldn't go get mental health counseling because I was afraid that I would lose my clearance or I was afraid to lose my job or I was afraid to impact my career. And you know those things really resonated with me. And, and so I um, teamed up with Dr. Priester and we started doing some analysis to debunk the myths. We developed campaigns uh, on social media. In fact, DCSA's number one like social media campaign was specifically about data pushing out information on mental health care and how that is, is part of our security clearance process uh, and how it's not. So uh, we also had recently, and I don't know if we have the link to it in the chat yet, but there was a webinar that we pushed out. It's available on our public facing website called Mental Health and Your Security Clearance. But the entire campaign is designed to get actual information in the hands of people who need it, whether they're the individuals that have a security clearance, whether they are first, second, third, fourth line supervisors, executives, people that have the opportunity to see somebody that is in crisis and may need help and give them the opportunity and the permission and arm themselves with facts and figures to debunk those myths. Um, but the goal is ultimately to help people to understand that it is okay to treat their physical health as equally as they treat their emotional health or their mental health. That, you know, I think, um, I can't remember who said it, Dr. Priester may remember, but, you know, there's, a, there's this concept in, in the Army and the Air Force and the Navy and the Marine Corps that it's all about your physical fitness, right? Every military service has a physical fitness test. It's how fast can you run, how many push-ups can you do, how, how fast can you, uh, can you do some sit-ups or pull-ups. It's great. There is no emotional fitness test, though, no mental fitness test. Uh, and, and I think that we tend to overly, even at, in, out into society, to focus on what we can see and not necessarily the things that we can't see that are just as important. So employee well-being, per se, to me, is the combination of both mental and emotional health and physical health. So um, 
that's the kind of the meanings that we've been trying to get across with our destigmatization campaign is simply to arm people with the information to make them aware that it's okay to get the treatment that from a security clearance adjudication perspective we actually view treatment positively um, so with that let me transition it over to dr priester so he can uh, add on a little bit about that because he leads our team of adjudicators to handle all of our guideline i or be, uh, um, psychological consideration cases so dr priester thank you yeah marianne has just been a fantastic uh concept leader in this since she's uh come aboard and uh it's been really important because we've seen uh, our colleagues in the intelligence community, we've worked together on things uh, like the, the mental wellness initiatives. Um, but as Mariana said, I think that what DCSA adjudications can really bring to the table is, is that we can really bring hard data to dispel some of the myths out there that people are losing their clearance or failing to get their clearance in droves or that even worse, seeking mental health care is going to be a career killer. We want to see those eradicated, and I couldn't agree more with the other speakers that have already mentioned the importance of changing culture, and that's really something that I think Mariana has really um, kind of brought as a leader in our organization is we really need to get at the culture behind the idea that um, seeking mental health care or seeking assistance in any way is a sign of weakness or a sign that somehow that you can't be trusted. Um, so what we've done at BCSA in the past year is we've formed a specialty team to handle these very complex and sensitive cases. Um, and I've been re really pleased with my colleague, Dr. Jean-Jacques, uh, to really kind of lead adjudicators who already have a good background in psychology. You know, certainly we have adjudicators that have backgrounds in a lot of different things, military service, business, science, uh, and we're pleased to have some who are actually psychology prepared in the past as well. So we've been able to take these folks that have a core discipline, have a core understanding of the mission, and really kind of work with them. And it's been a great success. So not only have we had a lot of individuals uh, ask for our presentation, we have sort of, a, as we summarized on the CDSE uh, presentation website, uh, but also just uh, to different organizations, different battalions, um, spoken to them about these very issues and brought what I feel like is a really key punchline, and that is the, that upside-down pyramid, to really show the data does not support the myth that this is going to be a career killer. That's, um, that's really helpful insight from both of you. And I see, Mariana, they did put the um, link um, on your webinar in the chat. So people um, should definitely go there. It seems like there's a lot of great resources there. And I think what I heard from from both of you, one, culture, 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 yes. And I think we heard a little bit about that from Ken and even from Mark talking about stigma. So that is a, such an important piece of it. Um, but also I heard, and I think it was just a powerful statement, Mariana, that it is actually looked upon favorably when people get the mental health care they need. I think that is worth repeating. Um, that is viewed as a good thing, not as a bad thing. Um, and perhaps, to the stigma that Mark was talking about even more broadly. We all need to hear that, um, you know, again and again and again for it to, to, to seep in because the, it is counterintuitive given the stigma that has been out there for so long. And Mark, I understand that uh, NCSE also has a mental wellness module. I think it began around 2018. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what kind of success you've had? Sure, Amy. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. It's actually um, a great module that is viewed by a lot of um, the workforce in the intelligence community. And, and I think one of the strongest pieces of evidence um, for anti-stigma efforts is to involve uh, normalizing interactions with individuals who live with and experience um, uh, mental illnesses or conditions. And I believe the success of the module centers around that aspect. So viewers can watch real life narratives um, to include senior individuals within the IC who out the narrative, they use these narratives to outline experiences um, of, of their battles and, and how they sought mental health counseling or treatments and the benefits um, that are associated with pursuing um, and addressing um, uh, those type of conditions. So the, the module was created um, Actually, within our director, we have a behavioral analysis research team, and they uh, pulled 
together a lot of, of um, experts in this field to talk about the content of the module. And it, it does a couple things. One, it dispels um, common myths surrounding mental illness. It identifies and discusses um, what some of those common uh, conditions are. And it also talks about mistakes people make when they're interacting with people in these type of discussions. But again, I think the strongest part of the module is it provides videotaped interviews with um, individuals uh, that are productive members of the workforce who are expounding on their experiences um, with mental illness. So the entire government workforce uh, would benefit from this training as, as it comprehensively provides information on mental well-being, it, it reduces the stigma um, surrounding mental illness, and it also talks about resources that are available to the intelligence community um, so that people with free resources, robust resources that people can pursue. Mark, can I just, I just want to dig a little deeper. You, you made a comment about how the training um, uh, causes uh, or helps highlight where people may do the wrong thing um, in, in this process or say the wrong thing. I just wanted to, can you expound upon what that is a little bit? What is the wrong thing? Sure. So when I say that, well, one thing I just want to touch on is we are looking at um, uh, training across the board for investigators and adjudicators. So that's one aspect of it. Um, one is the investigator, if someone should disclose something, what, what are the questions that should be asked, right? And, and what are the things? But, but as far as the wrong thing in the workplace, um, there are certain... Um, phrases, certain words that are thrown out, not intentionally to be offensive, but something which could be offensive um, to someone who is who is undergoing some sort of treatment right. for mental illness. Yeah, no, that's really helpful. Um, and I think if you're working both sides of it, both on the investigators who may um, uh, just be uneducated um, or misstep unintentionally, and also as colleagues and coworkers, that uh, that that may unintentionally say something that they don't mean um, or that offends um, somebody that may be really struggling. So um, thank yeah. you for that. You know, one thing I'm curious about also, Mark, uh, how would you how would you address the effectiveness of the module so far on the mission? Because at the end of the day, we're you know we want to take care of our people because we want our people to be well. To Mariana's point, physical fitness and mental wellness are are equally important. But how have you seen that uh, also impact the mission? Yeah, so it's it's just again, it's it's about shifting the culture and and the perception and, and destigmatizing. So it, what this does, it, it's available throughout the community. And we send out reminders, as you know, May is Mental Health Awareness Month. Uh, during that month, we throw out the resources and, and encourage people to look at that. I know in NCSC, uh, our directorate and, and workforce, we encourage them to look at that on an annual basis as a refresher. Um, so it has had a successful impact on shifting that culture and also destigmatizing uh, the whole um, perception that seeking mental health um, uh, treatment and counseling would have a negative impact on your security clearance. So it's, it has really been a successful module and a campaign uh, that we've used throughout the intelligence community. Okay. Well, it certainly lets uh, the employees know that that's in uh, high, you know, it's a important place for the leadership if they're asking them to train on it annually. Um, so it's certainly a focus area. Ken, you, uh, you alluded before that maybe you could give us a little more insight um, around what the Fort Meade Alliance is doing and the role that they are playing in helping address mental health issues um, in the intelligence community. Can you share a little bit more about that? Sure, and again, I wanna put this in the, in the context of, of resiliency and mental health is only one of the pillars of resiliency, I mean, physical, Physical well-being is uh, a pillar. The, you know, the stability and uh, and supportiveness of the family is a, is a pillar. Your emotional health is is a pillar. Uh, your social well-being. Um, you know, if you're a you're a uh, dorm rat and you sit and play video games all day in the dorm with no social interaction, um, that's going to affect your mental health event eventually. 
so the Fort Meade Alliance and working with the installation uh, is, is attempting to help build the resiliency resources of the installation um, so that we can uh, direct ourselves broadly uh, to the needs. And in one way, the, the post is, is talks about um, uh, a resiliency campus. And when you think about the resources that you know, I had it in my day, whether it's the gym or the childcare centers or the bowling alley, the golf course way back when, um, that's all part of a resiliency program that's been in place for a long time. If people avail themselves of those resources, that's helping strengthen the different pillars. Um, the, um, when, you, when you bring it all together though, Resiliency needs a place to reside, a, a center. Uh, so the Fort Meade Alliance Foundation uh, undertook to raise uh, three and a half million dollars working with companies like GD. Um, and we've taken the old Kuhn Hall and pardon my historian in me, but uh, Joseph Kuhn was the first commander of Fort Meade in 1917. So the building named after him, which was the old nurses quarters when the uh, facility was built, uh, is now the new Education and Resiliency Center. And uh, it sh it'll be opening, uh, a soft opening in August, and then uh, later on in the fall, uh, fully open. Um, so we take all the education resources that exist to work on degree completion or degrees, um, but we build it in, into a, a facility that also has a, a fully stocked kitchen. Um, we've already got courses uh, designed working with the University of Maryland, uh, uh, a, a meal in a mug to try mm -hmm. to get the, the, um, the dorm rats out and teach them how to do nutritional cooking uh, just by cooking it, cooking what they have and putting it in a coffee cup and eating it out of that. But instead of uh, ramen noodles like we survived on in college, uh, it'll be a little healthier than that. Um, so I think I still all those survive resources. on ramen, Ken. What's that? I think I still survive on ramen. I know, but <laughs> you know, what are the long-lasting effects that you may be experiencing, Amy? Think how much further you could have gone. Yes, no, <laughs> I, 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 I definitely understand that. Uh, but I interrupted. You're, you're talking about the other programming that you have there. Sure. Um, so the idea there is with an education resiliency center, people who may be seeking mental health assistance, I can find that in, in the facility and be directed uh, where to go. But as far as the community knows, they're walking into a place where they may be taking a cooking course. Okay. The people who are going in for the cooking course are also building their resiliency. So it's, it's a place where we can kind of put anonymity in instead of walking into the wing of Kimbro that deals yeah. with mental health counseling. Um, so that's kind of the, the idea of it. An ancillary uh, thing that we're doing along with um, the Education Resiliency Center is a portal and it's available online and, and the, web, the website, the link that I provided earlier uh, has a link to that portal, um, connects um, service members and family members to resources both on post and in the community. Um, that can help them deal with those various pillars of resiliency. Um, in my retirement, one of the detours I took, I ran a therapeutic horseback riding center. Um, and I worked with several veterans um, that were able to reconnect with their families and get into a um, post-military career by the bond that they formed with a horse. And then it's magic that happens. Some people it's horses, some people it's dogs, some people it's fly fishing, some people it's a counselor. Mm -hmm. You just don't know what the resources are, but you know that you have gotta find something out there that, that can work for you. And the portal can help you make those, make those connections. Uh, okay. The military folks on Fort Meade will be the first to tell you that they don't have enough resources to deal with the need. So it's important, and we talked about partnership, uh, the panelists have talked about partnership and community building. It's important to bring all the resources from the community to bear uh, to support 
the important mission that's going on on Fort Meade. Um, and whether it's family members who aren't at the top of the, um, mm -hmm. the pyramid for getting counseling resources from, from the military can get connected to Kennedy Krieger for yeah. the resources that they need there. So that's what we're trying to build. And then the final piece of what the Fort Meade Alliance is doing is, is my family and military affairs uh, committee. Um, and we meet on a monthly basis. We met, meet, have met virtually for several many years now. Uh, but what's so cool about it is the breadth of people that are coming together um, to talk about what resources they have uh, what things are going on on post, what things are going on off post, and the sharing that happens. And we'll have 20, 30, 40 people on our calls. But for me as the chair, what's really cool is all the networking that's going on when we hang up. People mm -hmm. call it, hey, that really sounds cool. Yeah. I, I need to plug into what you're doing. I have people that will benefit from that resource. So that's kind of the package that, that Fort Meade, the Fort Meade Alliance has put together is this educational resiliency center, a portal of installation and community resources, and a committee uh, that's looking at programmatic and, and connections uh, that we can bring to support, uh, support the post. So the suicide awareness uh, coordinator on post will be the first to tell you that um, his job doesn't rely on counseling. His job relies on um, just a sense of well-being of, of people, yeah. of folks getting yeah. out and doing something. Um, yeah. This Monday is a huge Fourth of July celebration with music and all that. I hope there's not dorm rats or I hope there's not family mm -hmm. sitting in their houses, yeah. but getting out and being together and enjoying yeah. that kind of that event. Yeah. And that's part of the mental health um, Great. foundation that we that we need to have and we need to continue to resource i will tell you i took a tour of that building i don't know two months ago and it's fabulous so i think the point that you made it is much easier for somebody to walk into a, a building that could be offering cooking classes or online training or perhaps they're talking to somebody than it is to walk into Kimbrough Army Hospital for uh, you know mental health um, resources. And your other point about family, because we have certainly seen in our workforce that our employees' families are availing themselves of mental health resources just as much as employees are. So they are a big part of the overall equation. So I, I really appreciate that. We have lots of questions in the chat that are coming in. So I'm gonna keep us moving on here. Um, and a lot of specific questions, and I'll, I'll roll some of them in here, but we did establish clearly that the denial and revocation statistics that Dr. Priester have put together validate that a cleared individual is not likely to lose their clearance after seeking mental health care. So we have put that out on the table, but I do think we have to probe a little deeper here because we have some specific questions in chat and and, and ones that I'm sure Mariana and Dr. Priester and Mark um, and, and Ken, you also have heard. So let me just ask directly, Mark, is, is treatment for mental health and particularly counseling a sufficient reason to revoke or deny eligibility for a clearance? A lot of people talk into a lot of people now and, and, and help us understand how that impacts their status. Sure. So, yeah, the answer is no. And I, and I think um, the statistics that you showed earlier, we have to rely on factual data uh, to counter the myth that an individual is likely to lose or uh, fail to gain a security clearance after seeking mental um, uh, health treatment or experiencing mental health sy symptoms. So the data on um, clearance denials and revocations shows clearly um, that this is not the case. You know, one thing I do want to give a quick shout out to DIA. They have a really good debunking the myth campaign where they bring uh, Office of Security Psychologists and Employee Assistant Program uh, representatives together to collaborate and brief this type of information out to their workforce. And they do a, a really, really good job on that. And it's just one example of the collaborative work being done across the IC and, and between not only security professionals, but psychologists employee assistant um, program representatives, and of course the, the security officers thrown in there. So that's a, a very good, the other thing is, we've been doing an outer, a lot of outreach with, with industry, and I, and I just wanna say that 
the I know I'm expanding. The answer to the question is no, but I'm talking about the collaborative effort to get this message out. Yes. And yes. one thing with with how are you really campaign that General Dynamics is doing. Uh, there's another campaign out there. It's okay not to feel okay. Um, and I think we need more of this to really hammer home the point that the answer is no, that treatment for mental health or counseling is not a sufficient reason for a denial so, or revocation. So can I, we had a question in the chat that is along these lines, but there are several with this theme. So can I just um, push on that a little bit more? Because my question was about if you have a clearance already, but I have a question in here about what advice you would give to college students who sought counseling during the COVID pandemic and seek clearances. So if you're seeking a clearance and you've had counseling, does, does that um, somehow disadvantage you? Yeah, so, so the answer is no, but what I know we're probably, um, hopefully we'll talk about the efforts to modernize our, our questionnaires for national security positions. Yes. Um, but that is one, one aspect of this. Um, you know, you, you think about uh, uh, mental health and how it's evolved over the years, the kind of the same thing has happened during the investigation process. And we really need to modernize that. We need to get to the heart where people are not fearful to disclose any treatment or counseling when they're applying for a job of national security. Okay, so okay if you've had counseling and you have a clearance and okay if you had counseling and you're seeking a clearance. So. One, um, and maybe this is for Mariana or Dr. Priester, but also how about medications? Are there any medications that make you automatically ineligible to keep or get a clearance? Yeah, I'm going to ask Dr. Priester to take that one because he's the literally the professional. Yeah, so the answer is no. And as a matter of fact, uh, medications uh, are really a red herring in many ways in, in terms of, of, of what somebody presents with because they're used in so many different ways, used in off-label ways. So there's really no way if, if you mentioned a medication regimen that somebody could definitively discern your diagnosis or your condition from that. Uh, but the short answer is absolutely not. Uh, okay. If somebody has a, a medication that's causing them impairment on the job, that would be a, a reasonable accommodations issue, but it's not a security issue. Okay, since, uh, since we have you, Dr. Priester, let me uh, just elaborate on another question that's come in. What role do evaluations from psychologists and psychiatrists play in the decision to grant or maintain a clearance? Can you help us understand that? Uh, sure, so um, at least at DCSA, what we do is uh, we, we certainly have a large enough footprint having all of DOD, about 95% of the clearances uh, USG-wide, uh, we um, don't by any means do uh, psychological evaluations on any substantive number of our uh, cleared population. We really only do it for the cases in which this is the only way that we can um, mitigate or attempt to uh, discern whether this condition or the behaviors of concern really spoken more precisely are going to cause a security concern. So what psychologists and psychiatrists do are not necessarily rendering any personal security decisions. That's not a minor lane, and in, in fact, that's one of the reasons why, as, as Mariana talked about with the behavioral science branch, we work collaboratively with uh, personal security specialists, adjudicators, who make those decisions in an informed way. But what in, instead uh, mental health practitioners like psychologists and psychiatrists do is they render opinions on whether or not the individual's behaviors of concern are likely to impact their judgment, their reliability, their stability, and their overall trustworthiness. Um, and so adjudicators can use this as part of the whole person uh, determination of uh, trustworthiness. And they will, by the way, oftentimes, uh, not rarely, uh, disagree. So uh, it's certainly a SME advisory opinion, not by any means uh, mandatory. Okay. Um, that's really helpful insight. Mariana, I have a couple of questions coming in um, sort of on this thread, which is, have we taken into account the potential effects of the new 360 evaluation on a person's access for um, uh, uh, their clearance or um, individual's mental health? Um, any thoughts on that? A lot of, you know, this continuous monitoring concept, how does that impact um, particularly given the, you know, the mental health struggles that are out there right now. So I, I think I want to tie a couple of threads together here in the, in the response to this question. And one was to get back to what Ken was saying about the pillars of resiliency. 
uh, and then to uh, the Dr. Priester about how we view mental health care treatment and, and medication and the fact that you're actually getting assistance. Um, because the, what we actually can find through automated records checks and continuous evaluation or continuous vetting, as it's now called, are generally things that are detectable through data. So criminal records, finances, you know, things that arrest warrants or, um, you know, parole violations. I mean, those types of things that we can detect. Um, what we, you know, what you find, and going back to Kim, you know, with the with the pillars, you know, your family connections, your uh, your spiritual connections, your physical well-being, your emotional well-being. You know, if all of those things aren't together, then you're you get kind of shaky. Um, and it's, you know, as it relates to specifically to mental health care, if you are, let's say, not seeking the help that you need because you're afraid, you're likely to self-medicate or self, uh, you know, take actions that will help you to feel better. That could be alcohol use. It could be drug use. It could be going out and buying, you know, 16 outfits because going shopping makes you feel better uh, until you get your credit card bill and then you don't feel better. So what I would say is that CV uh, or the continuous vetting is likely to be symptomatic of a larger issue, right? And that root cause of that issue may be a mental health concern and an undi undiagnosed or untreated or the subject is self-treating. So, you know, I, I'm tying back to that point of we view getting mental health care positively is because you as an individual are acknowledging that you need help and you're going out and getting it. And as a result of getting the assistance that you need, whether that's counseling or medication or combinations thereof, whether it's spiritual uh, assistance, whatever that assistance may be, you are often avoiding the undiagnosed consequences that come out in other ways, like alcohol and, and drug involvement and financial concerns are the big three that kind of coexist. All right. That's I don't really question per se, but no, I, I think it does. I, I, I think you've put some important threads together. I'm super cognizant of the time, so maybe we'll have a speed round here because we have uh, more questions than we have time for. But it would not be an intelligence community webinar if we did not talk about the SF86. So, um, you know, Dr. Priester, you did allude to this um, before, and, and Mark did also. Um, about a review of the whole person. So, Mark, maybe you can just remind us what the SF86 actually says about mental health. Yes, yeah, so it does ask um, a, a mental health related question, um, but I, the effort that we are currently seeking through our Trusted Workforce 2.0 effort, which Mariana alluded to, um, is we want to modernize those questions. And we want to shift from a focus on asking about um, treatment diagnoses to more of a behavioral approach. Um, recently, there was a working group uh, that was stood up to look at this question. And again, I use the word modernize to modernize what is being asked um, so that we are collecting the information that is relevant to an adjudicated decision. Um, so. Um, uh, that is undergoing. One thing I do want to touch on that Mariana talked about was the continuous vetting. Um, that's an aspect of Trusted Workforce 2.0 also. One of the key uh, aspects to uh, mental conditions is early intervention. And the fact that we're getting information in real time, I think, postures us to really treat this um, uh, investigative process have a well-being aspect to it. Whereas before, investigating everyone every five years didn't necessarily give us that real-time information where we can dedicate resources to correcting the issue much sooner. So Dr. Priester, I'll turn it over to you for any uh, added comments. Oh, no, thank you. Absolutely, and, and that working group uh, has been a, a great source of uh, kind of shared knowledge in terms of the kinds of things that matter to adjudicators and that really boil down the behaviors of concern that are security relevant. And by and large, these behaviors are transdiagnostic. They go between diagnoses. So a diagnosis is only going to tell, show you so far. And certainly, I agree that focusing on mental health care is probably the exact opposite approach we want to take. Uh, we don't want to discourage people from reporting mental health care, 
uh, from seeking mental health care. And on the contrary, as Mariana and as others have stated repeatedly, it's the most common way that adjudicators mitigate these concerns. So a lot of questions in here along, still along the counseling thread. So people want to understand if it is reportable. So if you have ongoing counseling, is that something that you need to report if you have a clearance? So one of the things that I recommend uh, when I'll get a call from a facility security officer or a, a security manager is really to look at the uh, uh, the SF-86 as the right and left boundaries with this uh, and ask the individual, since they last filled out a, a post-2017 version of uh, their SF-86 question 21, has their answer changed substantively? If it has, then it's probably reportable. But it, if, it, if it has not, then it's probably not. And again, very briefly to review, the SF-86 asks five basic uh, areas in mental health. Have you been uh, found mentally incompetent, adjudicatedly so, which is of course very rare? Have you had court ordered care? Uh, have you had inpatient care? Have you had a, a variety of mental health conditions that could by their very nature impact judgment, reliability, trustworthiness, and stability? And last, do you self-appraise as having a uh, psychological issue that could impact your judgment reliability? So if none of those questions are answered uh, affirmatively at this point, then in all likelihood, the mental health care is not reportable from that basis. Okay, that is um, really helpful. I have a question in here um, about basically our couple questions in the chat about the interaction between mental health struggles and alcohol or medical marijuana, um, other sorts of things that might be used to treat those. Can, uh, can one of you opine on, on that and provide any um, insight? Um, so I'll, I'll take a stab at it, and I'm sure Mark's going to want to take a stab at it too, because it would not be a, a webinar without Mark having to answer a question about medical marijuana or marijuana of any sort whatsoever. What I would suggest is that it is a better alternative for anyone who is applying for or maintains a security clearance to not self-medicate with anything, right? Whether it's drugs or alcohol or shopping sprees or a lavish vacations, whatever, but rather to go get the counseling and the support that they need from a mental health care provider, from a, from their clergy member, or you know, from whoever they need from their pillars of uh, support to, to get uh, that help. Because it is those other things where we self-medicate that are often become adjudicatively relevant meaning that they cause concern about judgment and reliability and trustworthiness. So Mark, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Mariana. I think uh, you raise a good point. I, you know, what is reportable in seed three, although the counseling is not reportable, but substance abuse when it deals with alcohol and illegal drug activity is reportable. So that's where the line is drawn. Um, and again, uh, I know we're running out of time, but uh, the yep. issue on uh, medicinal marijuana is we could spend a whole hour on that. But mm -hmm. the, the bottom line is that right now marijuana reme remains illegal as a federally illegal substance. And until that law is changed, um, we do not recognize, at least from a national security position, the use of medicinal marijuana as an appropriate treatment at this time. Um, now, again, the marijuana, we, we are understanding the landscape of, of recreational marijuana use is changing, and we are trying to, again, use the word modernize uh, to adhere to that, but as long as it is federally illegal, um, we do not um, uh, right. encourage medicinal marijuana use. Thanks, Mark. Well, Suzanne, I see you've uh, you've come back on here. I think what we heard today is that the intelligence community wants people to get the help that they need. There are a lot of resources out there for people to get um, with all the agencies. GDIT has them on our website. Lots of resources available and that we should um, encourage ourselves and those that may be struggling to get help if they need it. Um, because most of the time, inverted pyramid Almost never is your clearance revoked or do you not get a clearance because of that. So Suzanne, I wanna thank you and INSA for supporting this uh, important conversation today and to these panelists who have been um, so helpful and clear and direct in helping us understand the truth. 
Well, well, thank you, Amy, for doing such a wonderful job facilitating the conversation. And Mark and Dr. Priester, Mariana, and Katie, um, really thank you for sharing your insights. I think some of the themes and questions that you all brought to bear during this conversation, some of them weren't things that we, we covered originally when we were thinking about creating this program and will probably lead to some future webinars. So really thank you for enlightening all of us. And once again, thank you for GDIT support for underwriting today's program. And really for all of you all watching online, uh, thank you for taking the time to join us. Again, this program will be available on our website next week. I would encourage you all to share it with your colleagues um, because I think it's really important um, that we continue to discuss um, what sometimes can make folks uncomfortable, but I think can make our community stronger. Um, quickly, I'd like to give a plug um, for um, some upcoming events we're having. Um, next up is Trusting the IC with Kelly Arena, NSA's Chief of Strategic Communications, and Neil Wiley, the Cuomo Principal Executive at ODNI. Um, this program um, will take place in early July. It's a webinar and it's gratis, so I would encourage you all to check out the programming on our website. And also, when today's webinar ends, um, there will be a short survey. Please let us know what you think, what you'd like to hear about next time, whether you want to hear about it virtually or whether or not you want to hear from um, future groups in person that includes networking. Your feedback really does matter. Um, this does conclude this afternoon's programming. Not only have a wonderful day, but stay healthy and take care of yourselves. Again, thanks for joining us this afternoon.